Everybody, this is Locked On Bulldogs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today we are talking TCU game coming up in the national championship with Colin Post over at 24-7. You won't want to meet this because uh, this just in, we have a tight end that maybe hasn't been seen in the Big 12 like ever. Uh, and we're going to get some feelings on how TCU is going to do that right after this. You are Locked On Bulldogs, your daily podcast on the Georgia Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the podcast. I am Clint. This is Colin. Colin, how are you doing today, man? Clint, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I, I think I've said this to some Michigan guys last week, but just to be talking about the Frogs this time of year is literally something that has not happened in my lifetime and yes. most people's living lifetime to talk about a national championship appearance with TCU football. So just grateful to be a part of it, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Soak it in. Apps. All the haters just love the hate. They will hate you for being here and stomping on Michigan. We love you for it. Uh, Colin writes and uh, is over at 24-7. You can see Horn Frog Blitz over at 24-7 Sports. Go check him out as well. Uh, today, by the way, if you're over on YouTube, thanks for the subscription. Thanks for the like. Give us a rating. Give us a review. We love interacting with you all there. Daniel's not here today. He normally would be here. If he was here, he would let us know that this is for fans by fans. So we are big fans. If you want a homer take on UGA, uh, hi, I'm your guy. If you want a homer take on TCU, uh, Colin's your guy. We're we're fans, and we love this sport. It's a fantastic thing. If you're on auto, audio side, please go like, download, Stitcher, uh, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts. Uh, so, Colin, let's talk this game that's coming up, and let's talk about the enjoyment. Um, we have called these horn frogs. I, I I made a statement this earlier this week on the pod that said they are not efficient. As a team, they are opportunistic, but they are electric as a team. As you've watched this team this entire year, is that a fair assessment that the offense isn't efficient, it's electric, the defense is opportunistic and changes tides of games based on being opportunistic? Is that a fair assessment of the TCU Horn Frogs? You know, I don't know if it's a fair one. I think it's been true at times. It's probably the national perception because I don't think TCU really got much national attention, period, until probably late in the season when people kind of started to realize, man, this team actually could go to the playoff. And then I really don't think people really paid attention fully to TCU till last Saturday. And and that's so crazy to me. But, you know, when you go to a school – that has 10,000 undergrad. It's just not reality. The comparison, even between a team like Michigan and TCU is just crazy. And so what I've seen from this TCU team, obviously they've trailed a lot in games. And so I think it's seven games total this year. They've trailed and quite a few of them have had to come back in second half opportunities. So I think there, Clint, you're definitely right, is there have been some real seasons it, amidst this season where TCU has really been stale offensively, not gotten things going at all and but opportunistic is interesting term I think at its best the CCU offense can be very efficient just given the way I think Garrett Riley is is I mean he literally was voted the best assistant in college football this year and especially with a healthy Kendra Miller we don't know if he'll be healthy Mm -hmm. on Monday but man this TCU team is really well rounded and so I think what's cool is yes they do lead the country in big plays And so obviously they do thrive on home runs. Um, And then defensively, you did see the two pick sixes against Michigan. But at its best, I think this TCU team is very complete, which has led to them being able to finish games that are really close. Yeah, those close games. I mean, uh, people want to joke all the time that the closeness of these games should give us some sort of indication that TCU is not a good team. But when you win close games, that's kind of the the point of football you got to win in these dog fights and we've been on this podcast saying football is a very hard sport like it is not an easy it is insanely difficult and anybody can go down any given Saturday so the fact mm-hmm. that DCU's been in these games is quite impressive and you you mentioned the injury report is there depth on TCU at the running back position uh, if something doesn't exactly pan out for TCU what what is the depth like on offense 
Yeah, you see, that's honestly a loaded question, Clint, because probably about a week ago, I would have said not much. Amari Di Mercado is a fifth-year guy who actually played at JUCO the year before he even came to TCU. So this is his sixth total year to play some sort of college football. And for a long time in his career, he was like a three-yard per carry guy that really just mm. couldn't seem to get anything going. Had a career year this year, a little over 500 yards on the ground behind Miller. And then on Saturday, absolutely popped off in, in, in Miller's place, had 150 yards and a touchdown. His previous career high was under 90 yards. And so if we get that Amari Di Mercado on Monday, then Amani Bailey, who's a Louisiana transfer, he showed spurts of, of greatness this year, and he'll probably be one of the lead backs next year, assuming Miller does go to the draft. And so there are guys on this roster that can step up. However, I would say given – what we've seen in the past, um, TCU fans would be a lot more comfortable if Kendra Miller was starting this game. And unlike you saw at Michigan, where Corum, one of the best running backs in the nation, goes down and you feel pretty com comfortable with Donovan Edwards, I would say it's up in the air as to what TCU will be able to get from Amari Mercado. And and I'd say they're, they, they'd be pretty a lot more confident if Kendra Miller is able to play. Yeah, but one one aspect of the position on offense that I don't think has any question is this passing attack. I mean – my word, this home run threat that is there. Uh, tell us about the big old cat. We likened him to Julio Jones catching balls out there on the outside. That's who we think he reminds us on. Talk about this passing attack for TCU for dog fans. Yeah, I think what's really interesting about this passing attack is that Max Duggan for a long time of his career was known as almost this like Tim Tebow comparison where he was a bruiser and could run really well. But especially when you're throwing deep, just didn't seem to have that touch. And his freshman year lost a ton of close games primarily because it felt like he couldn't connect the deep ball. And it was wondering, is this just a narrative? Is this false? Or what we've seen this year is he just being used in the wrong ways? And I think Garrett Riley, combined with Duggan's hard work and I think some improvement on his end, has really shown improvement. And so we've seen a shift. They used to use Duggan throwing the deep ball a lot on the right side of the field and now more focus on the left in the middle. We see Quentin Johnson lining up left, going deep on that side a lot more. And so I think that's interesting because they're trying to play to his strong suits. There's a lot of play action, letting plays develop. And so that's really important. And what's interesting is, is Max Duggan completed – just under 50% on passes 20-plus yards down the field this year, which is extremely, extremely impressive. And, and something I was talking about uh, with a, a friend of mine today is that if you take out the Tarleton State game, which kind of clouds the stats, he's still at 48%. So, in, you know, take that out. He's still in games that really, really were close, was passing the ball really, really well. And I think there was a, a college football film room kind of released a tweet today saying Georgia's defense, that might be kind of a hole for them is that they're 80th in the country when it comes to defending passes 20 plus yards on the field. I believe it was 42%. So that will be really interesting. But as you know, Clint, and as all Georgia fans know, you got to have time in the pocket to throw the deep ball. And if TCU is not able to protect the quarterback, that will be a huge question. I think especially interior where TCU's offensive line is a little bit weaker. I'm not going to name any names, but <laughs> I think it's important to realize that, yes, Max Duggan is one of the best, if not the best, deep ball uh, passers in the entire nation, combined with one of the best wide receiver cores in the entire nation. But if you don't have time to throw the ball, they don't have time to go deep, and, and, and that'll be really interesting on Monday. It will be very interesting. Uh, we're going to come back after this. I'm going to pick up a point right about the interior because there was something that happened at the Peach Bowl for Georgia that not a lot of fans realize with Jalen Carter. We're going to come back right after this. But first, I want to check out Bet Online. Bet Online is your sportsbook experts. They have everything that you need right now to go bet on parlays straight up, over under spreads. Right now, the, it's been ticking down. The point spread is now 12 and a half. You can get under 13 for this TCU matchup with UGA. Get over on Bet Online. It's the official sports book experts of Locked On Bulldogs and Locked On Podcasts. It's the only one Daniel and I trust. We need you to get there. You should get there. Bet on this game. Uh, Bet Online, your sports book experts. Also, want to let you know about LinkedIn. LinkedIn has an incredible amount of people that you can get the right candidate for your job right now. They have over 800 million network and connections worldwide. It does not just post your resume or post your job description, get resumes and filter through them. No, get the right candidate for your job, your team right now at LinkedIn. And right now you can post your job for free. LinkedIn.com slash locked on college. That's right. 
linkedin.com slash locked on college post your job for free one of the most robust networks with the right people the right candidates for your team right now linkedin.com slash locked on college Colin, you mentioned uh, the interior, and I think a lot of people don't recognize that in the uh, Peach Bowl, Jalen Carter was kind of a non-presence. And, and this happened last year about this time. It was very, very weird. Uh, SEC championship that Georgia went up against Alabama got absolutely run out of the building. And I think a lot of that had to do actually with what came out later was a report of this flu that took out a ton of people, and you could see it. Uh, people were gassed and winded. And the same thing happened uh, with a name I know you want to get to, and so we'll get there in a second. But Jalen Carter was suffering under this flu. And during the entire Peach Bowl, uh, Kurt Herstreet also was talking about where is Brock Bowers, where is Brock Bowers? Well, he was also sick and had this incredible strain as well. So we're going to get to that. But uh, it's interesting. Dog fans, take a take a listen, because, yes, we need pressure. That's one of the things we didn't get C.J. Stroud to the ground, and we allowed him to scramble, get around, throw that deep ball. And, yes, when you are given quarterbacks six seconds to throw, uh, not many DB rooms in the nation can hold up against these college athletes it's just it's the sport it's hard i don't care who you are so it's almost impossible to ask him you got to get him down so yeah the interior uh, jalen carter i'm hoping has a feast day against that uh but let's go to the guy that you want to talk about and maybe i'll just say this what questions do you have for dog fans about uh brock bowers in this tight end room yeah, I think it's just fascinating to me to see an offense that really is just so powerful you know uh you know i think georgia was really underrated offensively for a lot of years, which sounds weird for a team that was considered the best in college football. But I think a lot of people, at least nationally and at least circles I'm in, underrate the year Stetson Bennett had. And I think kind of don't consider him as elusive and as dynamic as he really is. And especially when the Heisman ceremony happened and we were kind of seeing about the, the comparison, I, I don't necessarily think the voting was wrong, but I don't think Stetson was appreciated enough. And so this offense is fascinating to me. And what's fascinating about it is I see really honestly a lack of playmakers on it. And especially compared to TCU where there are five receivers that all could be a wide receiver one at a lot of schools in the big 12, Georgia is a tight end first offense. And that Though there are some good tight ends in the Big 12, especially since Charlie Kolar is now in the NFL, is not at Iowa State anymore. There's not necessarily a tight end first offense in the Big 12. So that will be interesting to me, especially if he gets switched out onto a linebacker. A couple of TCU's linebackers thrive when it comes to hitting and filling gaps, but when it comes to coverage and speed, especially against big athletic tight ends, they really struggle. And so that will be something really, really interesting to watch, especially late in this game. TCU is a super well-conditioned team, but as the game goes on, covering someone that's faster than you, sharper than you, gets harder and harder. And so, yeah, I'm interested. Just, Clint, what, what are your thoughts on, on the way the Georgia offense is built? How does Brock Bowers kind of dice defenses up? And, and based on what you know maybe about TCU's defense, how big of a problem do you think this will be for them? It'd be, it'd be helpful if I had my microphone unmuted. Uh, that'd be really, really helpful. But I'm back now. Uh, we were talking about this earlier on the, the week. Um, this 3-3-5 defense that TCU runs uh, is, is unique because we also run a lot of 5 DB, but we have these two uh, linebacker as well as four down linemen. And so mm. this star position, this kind of hybrid nickel dime, we, it's a star in our defense. The 3-3-5 is interesting because on the surface, it looks like that's going to be a, a matchup better for TCU because, yes, these tight ends. Uh, I think is, is Hodges the kid's name, uh, middle linebacker for y'all, uh, that I saw. Yes, Jamoy Hodge. Okay, uh, Hodge. Yeah, Jamoy Hodge. You know, Hodge. coming up with his, with his arm up. That got a bogus roughing the passer penalty, by the way. That thing was absolute bogus. But yeah. he put his arms up, and the closing speed, as you were talking about, wasn't necessarily there. Yeah, that guy likes to hit, but closing speed's not there. And you yeah. saw Ohio State, who has maybe – a little bit of a faster linebacking core, not be able to keep up down the seam. That's where Georgia went on the big fourth uh, fourth quarter drive, as well as to Brock later on. Uh, I think their their linebackers got targeted I think nine times, and of those nine times, it was over 120 yards, uh, and it was it was just incredible what Georgia was able to carve up down the middle. So. Yes, um, this three three five. It, it, it's probably going to be in on the safeties a great deal to run with because if it is one on one with a linebacker, there hasn't been one yet in the SEC. Uh, and I know we get in Big Twelve and, and SEC and all that, but I, linebackers in the SEC 
run fast. They are they are very, very, very quick. We have a couple of them as well. Uh, but I haven't seen one be able to keep up with Brock or Darnell Washington. Uh, and yes, I'm glad that you're able to understand and able to see that our offense does run through these tight ends. It's it's they set up everything, the play action, the rollout, the blocking on the on running games. It is predicated on the tight end. So if TCU wants to go ahead and drop man and bring some pressure and expect the linebacker to keep up with Brock. Brock's not running five yard hitches or five yards outs. He's going 25 yards down the field on a seam. And yeah, that's going to be a problem uh, if speed's not there. So it's either going to be cloud coverage over the top or zone coverage, or they're going to have to get home with four and hope that uh, maybe the three to four guys that they bring get to Stetson. Because uh, as you mentioned, he, he is elusive. He can run in the pocket a little bit, and he's always looking downfield. He's not looking uh, just to, to escape pressure. He's looking to escape pressure and complete passes. So uh, maybe give us a little insight. This three three five defense, where is the strength of TCU's defense? Yeah, first of all, I think the obvious one, but one that was even more prevalent against Michigan is just the cornerback duo. Travis Hodges Tomlinson won the Thorpe Award, but I personally think that the best cover corner on TCU is Fig Newton or, or, or Josh Newton, um, as he goes by. It, he, he had zero targets against Michigan, just one of the more unreal cover corner performances in a big game I've ever seen. And I just remember walking out of that game thinking, Man, I didn't hear anything about Josh Newton all game. Turns out, yeah, zero, zero targets. And so he was a first team all Big 12 guy. It's not like he didn't have a good year, but I think THT kind of was more of an interceptions, pass defense guy. And he obviously won, won the Thorpe Award. He's a bigger name. He's been at TCU longer. Josh Newton transferred from Louisiana Monroe this offseason. So I think that is just a huge advantage is Georgia will just have very little opportunity when it comes to their wide receiver one and wide receiver two. Um, and it may be a cornerbacking duo that I don't know if there really is in the entire country. And I think another thing is that when it comes to the linebacking core, you obviously mentioned Jamoy Hodge, who physically probably keeps up a little better with Bowers. But when it comes to the speed and athleticism, D Winters, he's he's only 6'1 versus the 6'4 of Bowers, but he's still 230. He's still fast. You saw him with the pick six against McCarthy, almost had a couple sacks off the edge against McCarthy as well. So he kind of plays in between this linebacker and safety position, sort of what we saw like Jalen Petrie do at, at, at Baylor. And that's been really interesting. And so I think that's a strength too, because he's really all over the field. He fills a lot of holes that when it comes down to speed, mm. maybe a guy like Jamoy Hodge or Shadrack Banks can't. And then I think also in the backside, Mark Perry, not quite as good as coverage. We've seen him cut, drop a couple of interceptions in the last two games for TCU, but he's all over the field. And when it comes to open field tackling, uh, with the exception of a guy like Deuce Vaughn, who I don't know if anybody is good at open field tackling. Uh, Mark Perry is really good. So that is a case where I think even if a linebacker gets switched on to Bowers, you know, I trust a guy like Perry in the back um, or it may be even D Winters if it's, if it's near the sidelines to maybe cover that play and prevent it from going from 15 to 30 to 45 yards. But I still think those weaknesses that you mentioned are there and, and Georgia will probably look to exploit them. And, the last thing I wanted, was thinking about while you were talking is what we saw when Michigan beat Ohio State I thought was fascinating. Ohio State did not seem to game plan for the over-the-top because they were so focused on the tight end and maybe the short game and Ronnie Bell um, more to the middle and closer, and that allowed Cornelius Johnson to get behind the yep. defense and have two deep balls that really blew that game open. I think if TCU game plans overly hard for a guy like Bowers and you see a guy who maybe even hasn't made any too many big plays for Georgia all year, break open a 70 yard touchdown. That could be a difference in the game where TCU may be over prepared and left the yeah. backside open. So that'll be another thing to watch. And, and that could be a tide turner late in this game. Yeah. The biggest thing for us, AD Mitchell, our top wide receiver hurt for most of the year comes back, had a very, very big impact in this game. It looks like he just catches touchdowns in the playoffs is what he mm. does. And then Arian Smith. Yeah. That four, two speed on the outside where I don't care if the defender for Ohio State fell down or not. That guy was cooked because Aaron Smith blown past him. So, yeah, if you dedicate some over-the-top bracket coverage on the Bowers, um, Georgia fans might feel very confident in that. Now, you, you're talking about leaving these corners on an island and, and having these four corners. So maybe TCU 
doesn't mind that. Maybe they're going to say, yeah, you guys take care of the edge and we are going to take down the middle. Uh, and that is really maybe where this uh, this battle really is won or lost is on that. If, if those corners on an island can keep up with AD and Arian, uh, as well as a number of other uh, guys that Georgia rotates through. Uh, we're going to come back after this break. But first, we'll let you know about Built Bar. Built Bar is the tastiest protein bar on planet Earth. They have incredible flavors. Yes, they are tasty. Yes, they're healthy. And right now you can get a 13 pack over at Sam's Club. Uh, Built Bar has incredible flavors. They got brownie, they got orange flavors, they have chocolate, they have seasonality. And if you go to builtbar.com, you can find all of them and more as well as many other products. They got crispy, they got puffs. It is a protein bar, but it tastes like a candy bar. I'm not joking. Daniel and I have tried them. We love them. Get over there right now. Builtbar.com, the tastiest protein bar on planet earth. Uh, all right. We talked about the defense. We talked about the offense. Now let's talk about if I may, Sonny Dykes, just my gosh, man, what a job he has done in year one. I think everybody may have laughed a little bit, maybe, maybe under the radar, maybe talking about small school coming up, can't play with the big boys. And all he has done is gone out and showed out. Tell us what makes Sonny Dykes different for this DCU team. Yeah, and Clint, you brought up a great point about the laughing. Um, the, I can't tell you enough how just people did not see this as a good hire. And just want to quickly emphasize that Jeremiah Donati, the athletic director of TCU, was quite literally going through hell post-firing Gary Patterson, receiving yes. you know, death threats and, you know, hate and – you know, um, you know, you're not as good as Chris Del Conte. And then he hires the head coach at SMU, who for most of this decade, except for the last few years, has kind of been seen as the little brother of TCU. And so that was just such a weird season. And even I was skeptical. The article I wrote, I was writing for TCU student paper at the time. The article I wrote was, you know, I put national search in quotes because it just really didn't feel like TCU really went too deep when it came to coaching here. And so that was fascinating to me. But right away, I'm not going to act like I thought TCU was going to go to the Big 12 title or go to the national championship. But you could tell for sure things were different, at very least. And so I don't know if that was simply because Sonny felt like he had nothing to lose, but he instantly opens practices. He brings in an enti almost entirely new staff, but retains the guys that – the players like the most, a guy like Malcolm Kelly or a guy like Paul Gonzalez for wide receivers and for safeties. Players talked about them the most. So what I think we saw is Sonny Dykes put players first, and that's not something Gary Patterson did. Obviously, when you're in coaching for two decades, you probably aren't. Gary Patterson didn't understand that the world we live in right now requires putting players first in a lot of ways. Sonny Dykes does. And I think a huge way that's displayed is I already talked about Garrett Riley, but I think that's an example of where Sonny said, at least right now, when I'm playing with Gary's roster, I'm going to take this talent I have and put them in positions to succeed. Instead of asking them to do what I want them to do, let me figure out what they can do and have them do it best. And because of that, I even had a tweet last Saturday. There are almost, I think it's eight to 10 guys on TCU's offense that had a career year this year. That is crazy with an offense that was basically the same last year. And I think guys like Garrett Riley, Kaz Kazadi, who's been in charge of strength and conditioning. He was at Baylor and then Arkansas State, then SMU. So I just think we're seeing Sonny Dykes put players first. And that's had repercussions that are aside from football. I think the national media perception of TCU, I think the Fort Worth perception of TCU has all gone up. But I think player-wise and on the field, we're still seeing repercussions of that because these dudes literally go out there every day and believe that they're going to beat whoever they beat. And I think, obviously, that you can't chalk up their season to that. But when you are playing a team like Michigan, who absolutely out-physicals and out-dominates you on paper, and you go dominate them in the trenches, dominate them in the run game like you do, you cannot just chalk that up to, yeah, they had a good day. Those dudes are really dogs. And they believe that they're better than everyone. And I think a huge reason is because of Sonny Dykes and co and just the absolute culture he's brought into this program. And it is just really manifested in some pretty awesome ways. Yeah, you mentioned culture. And, and look, you don't go this far into the season and this close of game without having a new culture. That's one of the things that we talked about Ohio State. Ohio State brought their A game 
Georgia in many ways played a C, C plus game and still came yeah. out victorious because of the culture and the tenacity and the hard work that is set. And you, you really, really cannot put that on so much paper. It is something tangible you feel when a guy gets on. So if Sonny Dykes is for the players, those guys will know. And those guys know, just like Kirby, he's going to go to bat for them every single day. And there's this bond that they've said it time in and time out. Amarius Mims, uh, right tackle who started in this game because our starting right tackle was injured, goes in the transfer portal, goes, checks out Miami, and he comes back and he says, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I dipped my toes out in the transfer portal, and I saw it's just gross out there. People mm. don't have it like we do. And so having a coach that sets culture as the number one aspect of his team has huge, huge successes, and so I'm glad to hear Sonny Dykes has that. Uh, all right, we, we've talked about the, the strengths and the weaknesses uh, Colin, I, I'll, I'll go first. I said I want this the most boring game in the world. I want no fireworks. I want Georgia to rush the ball for 350 yards. I want Stetson Bennett to throw it 10 times, and I want to win 24 to 9. That, that's, my, that's what I want. I don't think I'm going to get it because I don't think you can so much. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to say this is probably lower scoring than people think, and I'm going to go 28-17 uh, Georgia is my prediction. Uh, Colin, what do you got for this game? Yeah, I think, Clint, you your prediction just now, if I was uh, if I was taking the, the TCU lens off, I, I like that a lot. I think it's really accurate because of the fact that I've watched TCU all year. I've, I've covered TCU all year. And I'm really hoping TC wins this game. I'm, I'm thinking I'm trying to find the biggest positives here. And I think this Georgia team, I'm going to say this, and I, I believe it. I still don't think they've seen an offense quite like TCU's. And so because of that, I think there is a chance that there are some things that catch, us, catch Georgia off guard. And like we saw last Saturday, TCU, I don't think they'll go up 21-6, to six, but TCU is able to hit them in the mouth in the first half that they maybe have not experienced a lot this year and definitely not in the SEC. Then that would allow TCU and then, you know, win the turnover battle and are able to kind of dominate a run game where I think if Kendra Miller plays, TCU has a clear advantage in and then protect Mac and blow off some big plays, you know, protect the ball, you know, a lot of factors. So I think if all of those things happen, Georgia is the clear, uh, the clear favorite here. But I think if all those things happen, TCU could put up high 30s and maybe low 40s in this game, which would be, which would be crazy. But I'm going to go, I think TCU wins this game, something like 37-34. Um, is what I'll go with. And uh, I think that's my best case scenario for TCU. I think more accurate and, and what most people should expect is kind of what you're saying. But I think there is a world where both teams rattle off a good amount of points. TCU is able to, to come out on top. You know, it's so unique because, again, the world of SEC and, and prolific speedsters and that sort of stuff. But uh, when you don't get a lot of game film, it, familiarity helps a great deal right in yeah. conference games and so when you don't have that uh, it changes things up and yeah i do think that tcu has enough wrinkles i've seen it all day long i saw a couple runs that i did not know how they fit those run fits up perfectly and they busted on michigan i was taken back by it and i wasn't taken back like oh no michigan's blowing it i was taken back going oh man tcu can ball with these mm. fits uh, and i do think it gives people fits like that so uh, yes uh, Georgia fan, do not sleep on the Horn Frogs. These guys are the real deal. Uh, and I love all y'all out there saying this is why we need to expand the playoffs. TCU would have been here regardless. They would have taken out all y'all anyway. So stop it with that nonsense. We got the two best teams in the nation. I'm fully convinced of it. Uh, Colin, go check them out 24-7. Horn Frog Blitz, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a blast. This has been Locked On Bulldogs, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We will see you guys tomorrow.